Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I am excited to welcome Dr. Rudolf Tanzi, world-renowned expert in Alzheimer's disease, co-discoverer of three of the first Alzheimer's disease genes, Dr. Tanzi serves as Vice Chair of Neurology and Director of the Genetics and Aging Research at Massachusetts General Hospital and the Joseph P. and Rose F. Kennedy Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Tanzi has also identified several other genes through his direction of the Alzheimer's Genome Project. Dr. Tanzi, thank you so much for your time. I know you're fresh off the stage from delivering the most extraordinary keynote, so I know that the audience was really left with just wonderful pearls of wisdom from you. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I enjoyed keynotes, a great audience, great meeting. So what does the field of integrative medicine mean to you? Well, I think it, it means um, being open-minded and flexible about how we do research, and how we treat patients. Um, you know, my, my goal, I, I, I'm co-directing a new brain health center at Mass General, the McCann Center for Brain Health at Mass General Hospital. And there, we're, we're, we're saying, how do we take things that we know are good for you that haven't gone through trials yet, where you only read about them in popular magazines, you know, meditation, yoga, diet, staying social, um, and bring that bring science to it. And what does science do? Science measures things. So if you want to assess what's good for you, especially what's good for your brain, and it's something like meditation or, or interacting with your family and friends or keeping a gratitude journal, you have to measure something. And as soon as you start measuring something meaningful, you're doing science. And I think that's the goal. And then as soon as you get results from that research, you bring it to patients. And there's no other branch of medicine that's doing that other than integrative and functional medicine. So when you started out your journey in uh, medicine, or even prior to medicine, I understand you received your uh, BS in biology, is that correct? Or BS in microbiology, oh, a BA in okay. history, and I, I minored in music. Oh, you yeah. did? Okay, wow. Yeah. So you went from University of Rochester to Harvard, right, yes. for your PhD? Yes. And so what made you focus your area on um, in neurology and more specifically in Alzheimer's. How did you wind up on that yeah. team? My original interest, and still is, is, was genetics. Okay. And at the time, I was about 20, and another doctor, Jim Gasella, was about 25. And we had the idea that we could use genetic markers to find the disease gene. Now that's mundane, right? When we started, and this was really, you know, I was the student, Jim Gasella, although he was just a little bit older than me was the mastermind. But at that time, no one had ever found a disease gene using genetic markers in the genome. I mean, today with whole genome sequencing, we have 75 million DNA variants known in the genome. At that time when we started, there was zero. We found the first six and then went up to the first 12. And miraculously, even with that handful, with the odds, you know, tens of thousands to one against us, we found the Huntington's disease gene. And that got me into neurology, because Huntington's is a movement disorder. And then I decided I wanted to build the first map of a chromosome, end to end, with genetic markers. So I picked chromosome 21, because it's the smallest, and I was a student, and I wanted to get done. <laughs> and chromosome 21 brought me to Down syndrome, because they have an extra copy. Down syndrome brought me to Alzheimer's, because, you know, uh, as Down syndrome folks uh, get older, and now they do live much longer than in the past because of good health care and understanding the, the syndrome, um, they unfortunately inevitably get the pathology of Alzheimer's. And that led me to, to wildly speculate as a student, maybe there's a such thing as an Alzheimer's gene, and maybe it lives on chromosome number 21 because it'll link to Downs. And then all of my superiors and higher ups at Harvard said, you know, look, you got to finish your degree. You can't, you're chasing a, it's a wild goose chase. You can't, you know, take such a leap of faith and, you know, I don't listen. I never listened back then. I still kind of don't listen <laughs> due to want, you know. And, and sure enough, it worked out. I found the first Alzheimer gene in 1986. And, it, and just as we predicted, it was the gene that makes the plaques. 
and now to this day, that gene's the number one drug target in Alzheimer's and how we target those plaques early on, way before symptoms. Now is, is how this we, the is how, beta amyloid? Yes, and, the okay. beta amyloid and plaques. Tau. And how we're going to stop those plaques early, early on, 10 years before symptoms, is how we're going to stop this disease. So what kind of advances have happened since that time? Oh, well, it's been a roller coaster, right? We put those genes, you know, we, we, we found several of these familial early onset Alzheimer genes that cause the disease under 60. The mutations are, are dramatic. They guarantee the disease when you inherit them. They're terrible. Luckily, it's only 1% of all cases. Um, but then, um, when we put those mutations into mice where you study them, the mice would make plaques, but they weren't getting the rest of the pathology of Alzheimer's. So that led to a question, that, you know, is it, do plaques really cause Alzheimer's? Well, all the, the genetics, all the genetics at the time said so, but we couldn't get that final proof. So the big breakthrough was this a few years ago, we developed what's called Alzheimer's in a dish, where we took, uh, where we take human stem cells, turn them into different types of nerve cells, plus some of the other types of cells in the brain, and the key is you grow them in a gel-like matrix that mimics the gel of the brain. Because the brain is like jello, it's three pounds of jello. It would quiver if you didn't have a skull around. Mine might be two pounds, but yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, but, but, you know, so we mimic the gel, and, and sure enough, um, you get the plaques, and then you wait, and then you get the rest of the pathology. You get the tangles. So what we couldn't show for decades in the mouse that led to all kinds of debates where grown men grown women scientists were screaming at each other, it's the amyloid, it's the tangles, it's this, it's that. It's because we were using mice. And guess what? Mice are not people. Newsflash. So once we were able to do this in a dish, we were able to show, yes, stop the plaques. And then we learned from imaging studies, plaques form 10, 15 years before there are symptoms. That's when you have to treat Alzheimer's disease. It's crazy that we wait until the brain degenerates to the point of dementia to then finally say, okay, now you have Alzheimer's and now we're going to try to treat you. I mean, imagine if we did that in cancer right. or heart disease. No right. one would live, right. right? So if you take the integrative approach to medicine, what are some of the modalities that people can do that don't necessarily have the gene, or even if they do have the gene, to just lessen their chances of coming down with Alzheimer's well, that would, that would keep their, you know, so to reduce their chance of things getting sticky and, and tangly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good way to put it. Um, we now have over three dozen Alzheimer's genes. Some of them affect the plaques. Some more directly affect the tangles, which kill the nerve cells from within. The plaques cause the tangles. And most of them, the new ones we found, I had what's called the Alzheimer's Genome Project for the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. Um, most of them are involved in the brain's innate immune system which is a fancy way to say the, the, uh, the system in the brain that involves what are called glial cells that control neuroinflammation. So glia in Greek means glue. We used to think these cells just glued the nerve cells together in the old days. And now we know that those glial cells, most of the time they're housekeeping, cleaning the brain, but they're always on the lookout for an infection or an attack. Now, when they see nerve cells dying because of amyloid and tangles, the evolutionary programmed responses, oh, brain's under attack, cause inflammation, wipe the area out. Then it turns out that inflammation through friendly fire or collateral damage kills 10, 100, 1,000 times more nerve cells than the original plaques and tangles that got you there. So what we've learned is that if we stop neuroinflammation in the brain, you can live with a lot of plaques and tangles and not get demented. That's really good news. So most of what I do in my books that I write with Deepak Chopra, the super brain and super genes, uh, most recently the healing self, is we tell people what they can do in their lives with lifestyle. We also talk about supplements that, you know, a lot of conventional medicine won't talk about that can curb neuroinflammation in the brain. Can that's you give what us you an example? Well, I use a mantra called SHIELD. Okay. And my next book that I'll be writing solo will be on SHIELD. How to shield your brain. S stands for sleep. You need to get eight hours of sleep, minimally do you seven. Get eight hours? I do. Okay. I do. Seven to eight hours of sleep, and even if it's not continuous, if you got six hours, take a nap. The important thing is to go into a dream REM cycle, and then enjoy that deep, what's called slow wave sleep after dreaming is over. That's when the brain actually cleans itself. I call it mental floss. 
So if you nap enough to get one REM and one deep slow wave sleep, you're cleaning your brain. You want to cycle in and out of that, you know, at least six or seven, maybe eight times uh, a day. So if you can do that with eight hours of sleep, great. If you can only get five or six hours, take naps. Um, then H is handle stress, mean meditate, uh, me you know, manage expectations, don't dwell on bad things on the past, don't It's be easy anxious. to say that, it's easy to, you know, to instruct that, it's easy to mm -hmm. advise that, how, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, oh gosh, I'm really in trouble. <laughs> well, that's where super brain came in, right? The okay. whole point of super brain was, it's never true to say something like, I am sad, I am depressed, I am anxious. It's at these, this moment. I these know. are feelings your brain brings you. When your brain brings you the image of a car driving by, a red car, you don't say, I am a red car. You don't identify with what you're seeing. Well, your brain brings you feelings in terms of emotions to help you survive, but the brain brings them to you so you can survive. The fact is, we don't think enough about our self-awareness that we naturally are able to know how we feel. So when you're feeling sad, you can step back and say, huh, I'm feeling sad right now. That's an amazing gift. That's what our, our last four million years of evolution of our brain gave us, this self-awareness. Use it. How you use it is mindfulness, but a better word is just being the observer, be the witness. I like to talk about mountaintop consciousness, um, a, a term that was coined by uh, the, the guru who started the Kauai Hindu monastery. Um, and uh, wrote a series of uh, books and said, mountaintop consciousness is where you sit on the mountaintop and say, what is my brain bringing me, the real me, who's observing what my brain is doing right now? Oh, my brain's bringing me anxiety. I wonder why. Oh, my brain's bringing me a feeling of depression. My brain's bringing me remorse. My brain's bringing me the vision of a lemon. My brain's bringing me imagination where my memories are being regurgitated into a creative image in the future. My brain's bringing me a memory. Your brain's an organ, like your stomach. It does things for you, the real you. So once you realize that, you can snap out of just, you can, once you really get that, then you can more readily snap out of a funk or, or the blues or depression. Could have used that advice a few hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so get, let's get back to SHIELD. What does I stand for? So I stands for interact. Loneliness, not living alone, but loneliness. People can live alone and be fine, but if you're living alone or if you're always alone and you don't like it, you're stressed out, then um, you're, you're, it, it's, it's, a, it's a stress just like anything else that is bad for the brain. It causes release of neurotoxic chemicals like cortisol. It can induce inflammation. And so stay social. Actively seek out family and friends. You know, the number one thing people say before they die, they wish they did more of, was hang out with family and friends. Right. So it's number one, always. So, you know, do it now, because being social makes the brain happier, and that also alleviates stress and inflammation that results from stress. And then E is obvious, it's exercise. So, you know, you don't have to go crazy, but at least a one-hour walk a day, or it, and at the very least, uh, if you're sitting down, uh, just have a, you know, just keep track, and a after an hour, don't sit down anymore, stand up. You know, um, they sell these desks, you know, where you can sit and stand, s you know, sit for an hour, stand for 15 minutes or whatever. But move, you have to keep moving. And exercise, it removes plaques from the brain, it clears inflammation, and it induces neurogenesis, the birth of new nerve cells, specifically in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is what's affected in Alzheimer's. That's a short-term memory area that's uh, most uh, uh, damaged in Alzheimer's disease. So exercise is amazing. And L, can you guess what L is? Love. <laughs> Love is good. Some people say laugh. Okay, laugh, okay. Um, which would go kind of with interaction, okay. I think. Okay. Cool. But L is learn, okay. what, what oh, we're doing right now. Exactly. Learning new things because in the end, the degree of dementia is equal or correlates with how many synapses you lose. So you have 100 billion nerve cells. You have 
tens if not hundreds of trillions of connections between them, synapses, making up your neural network. And the more synapses you make by learning new things, and the more synapses you strengthen, because when you learn something new, you always, always associate the new thing you learn with what you already knew. So the more you, 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 you uh, learn, the more synaptic reserve you have. It's like money in the bank. You're making synapses so that it's, they're there in reserve. So um, once you start getting into trouble with pathology, there are more synapses you can lose before you lose it, so to speak, right? I better leave. I have to go study right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now, I mean, just doing I'm this, learning. right? Whoever's watching is learning new things, right? Exactly. So we're protecting them okay. from Alzheimer's right now. And um, D, I assume it's diet? D, very good, diet, okay. yep. So diet is broad. That means um, Mediterranean diet by far is number one um, in terms of uh, reducing risk for Alzheimer's. Um, less red meat. I'm vegetarian, but, you know, finding protein and things other than red meat, you know, maybe fish. I, I use other protein sources myself. Um, what about gluten? Uh, well, if you're sensitive to gluten, then remove it or reduce it. If you're not, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, I, I don't buy, I'm sorry, I don't buy into the whole gluten, grain, brain. I just don't, I just, I don't think there's any evidence that gluten causes Alzheimer's disease. What and about, I, obviously, I mean, there's evidence to prove that it causes inflammation. Yes. So if you have the inflammation, yes. you are more susceptible yes. to... So if gluten, yes, you're absolutely correct. Okay. So if gluten is causing inflammation in your gut, and part of diet is taking care of your gut microbiome, because your gut microbiome is taking care of your brain. It's, it's determining, helping to determine your mood. It's directly controlling inflammation in your brain. It's controlling the integrity of your blood-brain barrier. So if you're not taking care of your, your gut bacteria, you're not taking care of your brain. Now, if gluten disrupts your specific gut bacteria, causes dysbiosis, Yes, that's bad for your brain. Um, but I, but you know, people are different. Some people are sensitive to it. Some are not. In my family, we reduce gluten, so we have gluten-free products available. But we're not, you know. But we we kind of mix it up. We don't we don't remove it. How long have you been vegetarian? I've been vegetarian since uh, junior year of college. Oh wow. Was there, what was the impetus for you to go vegetarian? Honestly, um, I had a girlfriend <laughs> who was vegetarian, okay. so, I, so I did it for her, and then, <laughs> then I was so much happier. Wow. I felt so much better. Like, all my anxiety went away, test anxiety, Interesting. everything. I just felt like a new person in every way, so I said, I'm never going back. And luckily, the school had a great vegetarian line, um, so yeah, never, never looked back. So rumor has it that if you weren't a scientist that you are today, you'd be uh, a rock star on the road with uh, Joe Perry and Aerosmith. How did that come about? Yeah, I just actually just did a new album with Joe Perry and Johnny Depp and oh. uh, uh, a bunch of old-time rock guys. Robin Zander from Cheap Trick is on it, J.V. Johansson from New York Dolls, and it's a great album. It's called Switzerland. Manifesto, because Johnny Depp lives on Sweetser Street in L.A., and they call the studio Sweetserland. Um, and, uh, but what happened was uh, back in 09, GQ did this, uh, and Jeffrey Bean did this thing, uh, campaign called Rock Stars of Science. So they had people who were sci big scientists in their field pose with rock stars, and then they made posters and put it in magazines to bring awareness to science, get kids interested in science. So... Uh, Francis Collins, who headed the Human Genome Project, head of the National Institutes of Health, and I posed with Joe Perry. And, um, and afterwards, you know, we said to Joe, hey, you know, we play, because Francis plays guitar and sings. So Joe nicely arranged for us to do a gig with him. Uh, we put together a makeshift band and played in D.C. for Congress, and, at, at a, and we did a, pub a public awareness thing for the, about the brain and Alzheimer's with Francis on an acoustic guitar singing, and Joe, and I'm on keyboards. And afterwards, Joe said, uh, you know, you should come and jam with us sometime. And I'm like, okay, I'm sure that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, but it happened, and I, I went to jam with Joe at the one of the Alsmith Studios in Massachusetts, 
that was uh, in, in Joe's house, Joe Perry's house. And when we got done, he asked me, to, one of the songs we played, he asked me to come and play it with them on the Jay Leno show a few weeks later. Oh my goodness. So next thing you know, you know, I'm playing Jay Leno's show with Joe, and then I'm in the Alice Smith studio where they're doing their new record, practicing, and then they said, hey, you should play on the album. So then I'm playing keyboards on the new Alice Smith album, and then ever since then, I've been, uh, you know, Joe's keyboard player. So when Joe, you know, I don't have time to tour, right. but I did do some gigs in December for the new album, and, you know, they're local. I'm going to be playing with him uh, at the House of Blues in uh, Boston next week. Uh, you know, so I, I don't have time to, to do the long rehearsals and gigs, but I can do the studio work, and then if a, if a gig's in town, I, I, I'll go play. Uh. So over the years, um, Joe and I have become really good friends, and, um, you know, when he just did his new record, and um, I did virtually all the keyboards on that, and, um, you know, my, and I also have, I have my own music website where I do my own music. So my own music that I write is more kind of jazz oriented. Um, Keith Jarrett is a big uh, hero of mine and um, Bill Evans, you know, jazz piano. So I, I write a lot of music and, uh, and just vote online. It, it's stream, you know, streaming for free. And, you know, I get probably a thousand, about a thousand streams per day. So wow. it's just nice to know that a thousand people so per really day are, a rock star. are listening to my music, you know, but it's a little different than the stuff right. I do with Joe. <laughs> so how has, you being a musician, how has that influenced your medical findings and, and what does that do to the brain? Well, I do a couple of things with music and medicine. Um, one is that I, some people have a tough time meditating. Um, you know, I do some work with the New England Patriots and uh, Bill Belichick on brain health. Which is, uh, which is nice. I got a Super Bowl ring uh, nice. back in 16 for, for helping out in that regard. And, you know, it's trying to get football players to meditate uh, isn't, e isn't easy, you know. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things we did was we worked out ways to get people down into that mental state of meditation. You know, if you did an EEG, they'd be down into like that theta or, or even high delta state where the frequency is down around 4 to 7 hertz. So um, I wrote some music that um, has behind it a, a binaural beat that slowly goes from the alpha, beta, higher frequency, bringing you down to theta. And then these glasses, I, Deepak Chopra uh, supported it. He, he named them Dreamweaver. Um, and now they're using them in spas. They're using them in uh, airline lounges, nail. You get your nails done and you wear these things. So what you do is you, you, you're, you're getting a multicolored light show and music, um, and it slowly entrains your brain down to theta. So it gives you a meditative type um, experience. And we, we want to use this not just recreationally, but for PTSD, for people with chronic pain, et cetera. The other thing I did was I realized how good music is for Alzheimer's patients. So I started a music app for the, on the phone called Spark Memories Radio because you can spark memories. And the idea there is the memories, the music we are most emotionally stimulated by are the, is the music we heard when we were between 13 and about 25 years old. So the music you, you grew up with, okay. high school, college. So you put in the patient's, you, you download the app, you put in the patient's birth date, uh, if you know anything about their genre preference, and then just start spitting out songs from when they were between 13 and 25. And you know what? It doesn't even have to be a song they liked. It can be a song they hated. It triggers a memory. It just triggers a memory. And people are writing in like, you know, uh, if you're in the early stages, people write in, oh, the house is such a better place now because now my dad, who was always depressed and agitated and yelling and screaming, is happy when he hears this music. Or somebody else wrote, you know, my dad hasn't spoken in six months because he's in the late stages, more vegetative. And, uh, uh, and I got this one email, and they said uh, uh, Peggy Lee's song, um, um, Fever, came on and he did, for the first time in six months the father sat up and started talking about his prom and this red pickup truck and the girl he brought and then everything that happened in the pickup truck oh, after the prom <laughs> and, he, and the whole family was turning as red as the truck oh, my but they said it was great just to have oh, him speaking you beautiful. know it was like amazing so music has an amazing you know ability that's unreal and I can understand, I'm sitting here thinking about Phil Collins and my senior prom, so, um, but no red pickup truck. 
<laughs> uh, so anyway, it is often said that a man of science is very black and white. You seem to have a very strong spiritual side, and I don't know if that's from your artistic side, from the music, but when did, did you always have this? Did, when did you find it? And what um, spurred you to really try to develop that and that whole mind-body connection? Well, I originally grew up, you know, I grew up Christian, and I, I grew up, um, you know, really adhering to the idea of the golden rule and teachings of Christ, and always saw Christ as an amazing uh, person, you know, um, outside of all the, the religious stuff. Um, and I noticed in my own life that whenever I truly yielded to love and service, the golden rule, that things went better. Like when we were trying to find the Huntington's disease gene, and we knew the odds were like, we're pulling out a few random genetic markers, like a few needles in a haystack, and you have no idea where this gene is. And of the first 12 we randomly picked out, the first 12 genetic markers, two were linked to Huntington's disease. I think the odds of that were like 500,000 to one. But I was, I wouldn't say praying, but it was kind of a more of a meditation on, I'm doing this, and it sounds hokey, but it's true. You had another I'm, lab I'm, partner. Yeah, I'm, do, I'm doing this to, to love and serve on this earth before I go. And I think that's the trick. I think it's the biggest secret in the world. If your intention is truly to love and serve those around you, then the universe will treat you well, and you'll get lucky. So, I mean, you can call it spiritual, but in some ways it's self-serving, because basically, if you want to serve yourself the best, you serve others, and you do it with pure intentions. And as hokey as that sounds, that's how you get lucky, you know? So, let me ask you, was it divine intervention to run into Deepak Chopra in a men's room? I heard that's where you met. <laughs> we did. We, well, we gave talks together at TED Med uh, with Quincy Jones and Frank Gehry on, on, on aging. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're in the men's room and doing our thing, and then he turns over, he turns around to me, I'm like, oh, Deepak Chopra's <laughs> in the urinal next to me, okay. And he said, um, I really liked your talk, so tell me, is the brain a noun or a verb? Oh. Wow. And I said, it's a verb, but, you know, let's talk outside. <laughs> I can't do this. Um, so, um, yeah, and then, uh, then we started e emailing. We said, you know, let's write a, let's write a book. about." You know, we started, I started talking about the brain and how I see it and consciousness versus, you know, cognitive faculties. And one thing led to another, and then we ended up writing these books. Yeah. Beautiful relationship. Yeah. So now you have your third book coming out. Healing third self. book just came out. Third book oh, came out okay. in January. The Healing Self came out. And um, we have a new TV show that goes along with it on PBS called The Brain, Body, Mind Connection. And, um, and the book's doing well. The show's doing well. So, Are there any new advances that we can expect, you know, something, some big break to come over the next, you know, couple of years? I know you've been uh, at this for so long. There has never been a better time for Alzheimer's research than right now. First of all, the government finally increased funding from a paltry 400 million, now we're approaching 1.8 billion. And money makes a difference. Um, second, the FDA has come around that to consider us, consider us letting doing trials in people who don't have any symptoms of cognition, but have the pathology that will likely get them to the disease 15 years later, and are gonna let us treat those people with drugs to stop the pathology. And then if those drugs work, consider approval. And that's big because otherwise, if you're trying to treat, treat people who already have dementia with a drug that stops the cause, you know, it's like having a, somebody with a two-inch tumor and organ failure and with cancer already in those late stages, and we say, here, we're just gonna give you a tumor suppressor and hope you live longer. I mean, we've been doing it all wrong. You know, we took a lesson from heart disease and cancer. You gotta treat pathology 10 years, 15 years before. But the FDA insisted up till now, no, you got to treat patients with dementia and make them cognitively better. But we're, but we're using drugs that stop the pathology that started this 10, 15 years ago. Now they're saying, okay, you can do it. Take people who are cognitively fine, but have that pathology, show you can lower it. If that drug's safe, we'll consider approval. But we're going to keep an eye on it. You know, post approval, we're going to make sure that the incidence of Alzheimer's and those people go down, or else we're going to pull the plug but at least we don't have to do a 10 or 15 year trial that no one's gonna do a 10 or 15 year prevention trial. It would cost billions. By the time it's over, the drug company's drug is off patent. Mm -hmm. So, and the other thing is that we're learning so much more about, about 
um, integrative medicine, functional medicine, supplements, lifestyle, other things we can do. There's a big giant project in my lab on bioelectronics where we're, we're, we're discovering how uh, direct current and um, things like ultrasound um, can actually um, help the brain. We're, we're using, we're doing a trial on, on nicotinamide riboside, Niagen, that helps energy be increased in the cellular level in the brain. So a lot of things that we would have never thought of doing in the past in, in traditional research and medicine, now it's, it's, we're more open-minded and Alzheimer's is going to benefit from it. We'll stop right there. Thank you so much. Looking forward to everything. Thank you. Thank you.